Your goodness demands response. I pray that we would do that, Lord. You know, I pray. Amen. Exciting to be here with you. Uh, good weather. No warnings of tornadoes or severe thunderstorms or F3 or F4. And so um, I guess when we, we have that type of weather, um, we can hold off meeting because we won't be safe, obviously. And, uh, but I am, I am very excited to be here with you. Uh, if you didn't know, last week there were three youth pastors supposed to speak in our area. I don't know if God was saying, hey, youth pastors don't need to speak. Um, but th- he didn't say this morning, so I'm excited to be here with you and share. Uh, I was in- intimidated a little bit uh, because Chris, for the past month, has rolled out this idea. Hey, Philip is going to share um, vision, big vision stuff, big picture stuff. Get ready, it's coming. And the whole while, I'm like, man, I thought I was just really going to just talk a little bit about camp and just you know preach some. And so um, he's built up big. I'm excited because I'm catching hold of that heart and that vision, and I pray that you do as well. I'm not going to throw, I'm going to throw some scripture at you and some points, uh, but I want you to get the main idea. And it's on the screen, so you don't have to figure it out when you leave here, like what was he talking about? What was the main thesis? What was, what, what was the end game here? Here's the end game. Passionately love Jesus. If you passionately love Jesus, I have no doubt in my mind that you are a follower of Christ. And then that there will be certain things evident in your life because you will work only to live for him and do for him and grow in him and everything about your life will be about him. And I think this is where 90% of our church misses it because, hey, we love Jesus But we don't know how to live like Jesus wants us to live. And it's not about being perfect. But it's about understanding we're forgiven. And also understanding that there's a call in our life to to share love. To be love. So I pray that you get that. If, if, If you don't get it at the end, just know I gave it to you at the beginning here. Passionately love Jesus. It affects everything that we do. Acts 4, I'm going to camp in Colossians 1, okay, but I'm going to start in other places. So uh, if you want to follow, you follow along. Um, but I'm going to end up in First Colossians, or sorry, not First Colossians, <laughs> Colossians chapter 1. There we go. Acts 4, it'd be funny if you're looking for First Colossians right now, too. Somebody's like, oh, yeah, wait, it's right next to the second. No. Acts 4, (laughs) we got problems in, right? Acts 4, 18 through 20. So they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, answered the Sanhedrin, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge that. For we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. I just love the boldness of Of the disciples there. Because it is a boldness we have not seen. Up until this point. Because these are the same folks who denied. These are the same folks who ran away. These are the same folks who really didn't get it. They were with Jesus for three years. But it's like still like. Okay well we thought it was something else. And you're talking about dying on a cross. I'm like, come on, that's crazy. I thought we just. You're going to be a general. Roll in here and and we're going to establish the kingdom right now. And he's like, no, I I actually am going to lose my life. And so we we see folks who for three years saw Jesus pour into other people, do great miracles, love them when they complained. All of the stuff we can go through, dead to life, blind to sight, sick to being healed. And so the big changer was that they watched their mentor, their Messiah, ripped from them, mocked, beaten, tried, convicted, and killed. All before their eyes. They watched as they took him off a cross and put his body into a tomb. 
and in their moping and their despair, even going to back to some things that they used to do. Jesus shows up three days later, eats with them, talks to them, encourages them, loves them, and says, Guys, this is not it. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, this power from heaven, and you're going to go be my mouthpiece. You're going to go be disciples. You're going to go make disciples. And you're not just going to do it here, but you're going to go to the ends of the earth. I love it because there's this play on it because they're in Acts. Uh, Acts 1-8, you get the call and the commission. And it's not till Acts 8-1 when the church starts, pers- you know, Stephen, the newly elected deacon. <laughs> Sorry, deacons. We didn't get in that part, did we? <laughs> Is killed. And then the church scatters and goes. And let me remind you, it's not the apostles as much as the church believers going and sharing the gospel and growing and multiplying. So, if you needed to hear it again, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I Read it over and over, and I look at different translations, and I hope to see that there's something that says, hey, um, it's, it's questionable. You, you don't have to go. Or if you feel good, you can go. But there's no translation that says that. It says you are commanded to go. And so then I hope that they leave off the part about, you know, maybe it's just teaching. But it's teaching them to observe and obey all that I have commanded. And so then I I pray that maybe it's just like just converts. Let's just go hand out tracts and be like no more part into their lives. How the the saddest thing if we just went to the Capo people in Brazil and we just said, hey, y'all need to know Jesus. And then we walked away after they got him and never helped them be discipled. We never uh, helped get an IMB missionary in there to to work with them, Nick and Amber, just who are loving on them and discipling them. Jesus didn't tell us to make just converts. He said disciples. So, what is a disciple? Someone who follows Jesus. Someone who loves him. Someone who, as in the song we just sang, we can say our arms are open to surrender. You have your way. I love that picture because I think of my little girl as when I'm walking to her, she's like, hey, um, you can have me. You can have me. You're the boss. Carry me. Take me where you want me to go. That's us. We get to do that in our heavenly father. We're like, God, this is it. This is you right here. I surrender totally to your call. And so it's that idea and that picture like we see in... um, Luke 9, 23, where he says, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple, then you must deny yourself and pick up your cross daily and follow. Deny yourself. And I love this point. I'm going to show some points to you. Being a disciple of Christ does not begin with something we do. It begins with something Christ did. Let it sink in. Because you are not the amazing main character of the story. Uh, we got to be told that all the time. I mean, I think I'm fi- we're filming my own movie, right? You just have these movie cameras going with you, and you're just like, it's the this, this story of Philip, you know, his amazing day that he just had, you know? And I'm like, people are la- you know, watching and laughing. I'm the action hero, all this. No, that's not you. It's not, I'm sorry. You're not amazing. You're not awesome. I'm your friend, but it's not about you. Being a disciple is, starts with what Jesus did. If you need a reminder, here are some scripture. John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Ephesians 5, 25, he loved the church and therefore gave himself up for her. To be a Christian means to be a disciple. 
Being a disciple of Jesus means to follow Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple and the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. It's moving from Jesus as being Savior to Jesus being Lord. We have a lot of churches that are filled with people who just have Jesus as Savior. And all they've ever been taught was be good, do good, tithe, come to the church. And we're not going to lay anything else on you. Folks, there's a lot of dead churches, I'm just going to be honest, who are working through events, calendar filling, even some good Bible studies. But they are not sending anyone out into their community, into their nation, or to the ends of the earth. They're not multiplying. Folks, if you're not multiplying, you're going to be dead. I'm not here to to toot our our horn for a second, but I think we need to be doing much more. And so as we hear that discipleship, discipling, being a disciple starts with what Christ did for us. And that we start acknowledging him as Lord, not just Savior. It was nothing we did. God sovereignly pulled you to him. You have a pull inside of your heart towards sin. Why is that spiritual in here and holy? Like, well, I don't, sin doesn't affect me. Come on. Every day. Martin Luther had to struggle so much that he would go and repent and go and ask for forgiveness and confessions. And then he'd be writing down everything. And like, well, okay, hold up. I can't do this. It's not enough. I can't do it. And finally, they're coming to the point of realizing you can't. You can't confess enough because as soon as you did that, next you did something already again. And so it's understanding that we walk by faith. It's accounted to us as righteousness. Because our trust is in Jesus Christ, whom paid the atonement, was the atonement for our sins. Was the atonement for God's wrath. And so now we walk justified in grace and in faith. The disciples were bold. They walked with Jesus for three years. We have full revelation from God. It's alive. All scripture, God breathed. New Testament, Old Testament. Screams Jesus. Screams how we should turn our lives We have experiences in here. We have modeling in here. We have miracles in here. And yet, we still are passionless in our hearts. My intent this morning is not to come up and just like start shooting you with bazooka guilt. You feel bad and do do something, okay? My intention here is for you to see Jesus and for you to love him passionately. We were posed this question at the conference this week. Do you know what denomination is most mobilized for missions and taking the gospel out? We got David Platt, we got the IMB, and it wasn't Southern Baptist. It was a Pentecostal movement. J.D. Greer explained it like this. He says, because Southern Baptists are so guilt-driven... We're going to make you feel bad and preach on you. And then you'll feel bad about it. And you'll go in this temporary hot, you know, okay, I'm going to do it because I'm horrible. And I'm going to go do it. And then after we feel good about ourselves, we stop. And then in the other Pentecostal movement, it's gift driven. And so we're all gifted to do this. So we're going to go and do this. Now, I'm not going to get into a doctrinal debate here. But I'm just saying, hey, we all should be passionate about Jesus Christ. Right? I mean, you should come in here and go, oh, man, I just, I'm happy to be saved. Let me go tell somebody. 
No. Let's be compelled by love, as Paul was. Let's, let's, let, let's go and do and be doers because Jesus loves us. 2 Corinthians 5, 15 says, he says, He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died. And for them and was raised again. Paul says, uh, we no longer live for ourselves. But we live for the one who died and was raised again. Now, if you die and you're raised again, I may live for you, okay? But no one in here has done that. But Jesus. So our whole life as being a disciple is looking to the cross, looking to him, and going and doing what he's told us to do. And make no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He has called us to make disciples. So, to explain it a little better, there was a a story of a young Christian who wanted to know from his mentor, from his hero, from his hero in the faith, how do I follow Jesus as passionately as you do? What do I do? And so they were out fishing, must have been in South Georgia, in in the water fishing, okay? And so they're a little more hardcore than I am. And so they're out there fishing, and he's going, you really don't want me to tell you that. So you're going, whoa, I wouldn't even want to tell him that. Okay, well, let's go on with the story. He goes, a couple minutes later, no, no, please, just tell me how you're so excited and passionate in worship. Tell me how you get to the point to where um, you... You want to reach lost people and talk and have those conversations. And he says, I, I just want to fish. I, I, I can't explain that to you right now. I just don't have the time. I can't do it. Don't make me do that. Angrily, the young man of faith says, you have to tell me. He puts down his rod. You have to tell me right now. And the older mentor grabs him by the head And pushes his head underneath the water and holds him there. If he were to come up on the scene as the guy is kicking and screaming, he didn't tell him what he's doing. He just held him under the water and the guy is kicking and screaming and flapping. He lets him come up and he pushes him back down. And he does this and goes on for what probably seems like eternity. Finally lets him up. The guy, white-faced, crying, gasping for air. The mentor looks at him and says, when you want Jesus as much as you wanted that air, then you'll be passionate about people. You'll be passionate about the word. You'll be passionate about service. Come on, folks. Do we want Jesus as much as the air we breathe? I hate to step it back, but do we want Jesus as much as the money in our pocket? Do we want Jesus as much as the air conditioner that's pumping cool air into our house? Come on. Do we want him as much as the food that's on our table? Or the cars that we have in our garage? Do we want Jesus more than anything in this world? We must be a disciple. A response to God's radical love for us is that we radically love him and then we love others radically. The Christian life is a discipling life. I'm in Colossians 1, 3 through 6. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. I'll stop there for a second. Paul's talking to the church that he's not even ever been to. He didn't establish the church. So again, we have an example. I mean, and, and here's some of this, the, the crazy ironic twist of stuff. As Paul, through his ministry, he's going like, hey, I got to get to Rome. I got to get to Rome. Got to get to Rome. He never gets to Rome in order to start a church. And so by the time he gets there, he's like, oh, yeah, we're here. And so his letter is to a church that he hasn't even started in, in, in Romans as well. And so... The kick of this story is that it's not about Paul, but it's about people moving the gospel, the church moving and multiplying. I'm saying, don't get me wrong, Paul's awesome, 
But in this, he is recognizing. He says, guys, this is a church. We have prayed for you because we've heard of your faith. And then uh, in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Now, just pop in on love for a second because we have a twisted idea in, uh, of our definition of love because, you know, it's this feeling. Russ, oh, we just, we just, you know, teenagers, we just, I just love that person. Oh, gosh, really? You love them. You know, and my thing is I love tacos. I love burritos, okay? I probably love a burrito more than you love that person, that little guy or that little girl. I love it more. I'll be honest. We have this distorted picture of what love is, right? I mean, you, you stay with me long enough, Chris, will, and, and the rest of the staff will make fun. You know, I, do, I, do, I love food. I love Thai. I love all kinds of food. I'll just, I, I'm not going to start talking about how much food I love. you would be like, what? what? What's he doing? But we can't let that interpretation of love be the love that we carry on to our Christ. I love Jesus if I don't ever eat again. I love Jesus if he takes everything from me. And so... We have a chance, as we see, as Paul sees, he says, I see your love, and it's not just this feeling. You don't just go, hey, we love Blackshear. <laughs> we love you, Blackshear. We're loving out loud. In Jesus' name. Paul's like, no, we see your love. It's action. It's you going into the community. It's you loving people. It's you going, hey, we, no, we really, we really love you. This is why we're doing this. This is why we're in your yard raking it, okay? This is why we're washing your car. This is, this is why we're bringing you food. This is why we're playing with your kids and, and just, just loving on you and your family because we love you because Christ first loved us. And so it's that passion for Jesus Christ. And so Paul saw it. He said it was evident. He says, um, we have heard of your faith. And we have seen your love you have for all the saints. And it's because it's a love driven in the hope that is laid up in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel. Which has come to you as indeed for the whole world it is hearing fruit. And the whole world is increasing. As it is also does among you since the day you heard it. And understand and understood the grace of God in truth. Paul recognized what was going on. Paul recognized that the church was growing. Paul recognized that the church was growing all over. And so he's super pumped and super excited. He also realizes that it's because of Jesus' love and the focus on the hope in Christ that this love is going. And so I'm saying um, our response to a hope that is in Christ is that we will share love. And in that, how it's interpreted and how we can understand is that a disciple makes disciples. A disciple is a discipler, or a, a, a disciple is discipling. A big words would go, whoa, oh, oh, whoa, oh. whoa. I don't know that theology stuff. Okay? I can barely get through John 3.16. Okay, well, then you get through John 3.16 with somebody. Amen? You don't tell them what you don't know. You tell them what you do know. You tell them how Jesus Christ radically changed your life. How he called you. How he loved you. And then you, you are walking on your personal development. So you can help somebody else see and love Jesus more. That's discipling. It's not just found in the studies, folks. It's found in life. Our everyday life as we walk with somebody and we talk to them. Um, we live in the most connected and unconnected generation ever. Okay? Okay. Um, Connected as in we have technology all around us. We can get on and shoot uh, texts and emails to anybody and connect. We can uh, Instagram our lunch and people can like it or not like it. We can talk and chat video-wise with anybody, anywhere. Yet, you go into a real Starbucks, you go into real restaurants, and you see people disconnected from each other. I don't know how many people you're winning on Facebook to Jesus. I know how many people you could be winning that are sitting right around you at your work, at your school, 
Oh, we better not. We better stop. <laughs> Come on now. Don't send them friend requests. You need to start striking up conversations and just loving people. And I, I'm, I'm the world's worst because I'm like, God, give me an opportunity. Well, let me tell you, do you open your eyes every day? God's giving you an opportunity every day. And so we start to try to, try, try to direct God's path. Like, please, just don't make it that scary person at the dag, daggum gym or at the, at the gas station that you're saying, just go share Christ with that eight-foot man that's 300 pounds. I told the first service, I said, I, I, I'll share it with the old lady, God. Opportunities all around you. If you start listening. We were, I was in Chattanooga, Tennessee for a youth leaders conference. And every time I go, I get to, I get opportunities. I was convicted one of the years I went because um, we just ate some food. Love it. And uh, we're walking back to the conference like five blocks away. And so I'm, me and Ryan Callahan are, are going and, and um, this guy says, hey, do you, you don't have to tell me he's homeless. He says, can you have any money? I don't have any, none of us carry cash, right? So we're like, I don't have any money. And so I kept on walking. Got all the way five blocks to my hotel, sat in my nice warm bed and sat there. And God's like going, what are you doing? And I got my butt out of the bed. And me and Ryan, I said, hey, I'm sorry, man. I, I, you don't have to go with me, but I got to go back. And we went back and I bought this guy Starbucks. All the Starbucks he could. I wasn't going to give him money. I just gave him Starbucks and, and, and all kinds of uh, danishes and sweets and some coffee. And we sat there for about 30 minutes to an hour talking about life. And I was heartbroken as I saw brothers and sisters of mine who were at the conference walk by and not even look. Come on. How many times have we crossed the street so we didn't have to engage somebody? How many times did we walk down the other aisle at Walmart so we're like, oh, I know that person. I ain't going to talk to them. I mean, am I just preaching to myself? Because I think it's, you know, I mean, it's me. So I'm like, oh, that's a long conversation. (laughs) Not today. God's putting you in those areas for those times. God bless it. Take advantage of it. Stop going, God, just show me your will today. Hey, his will is for you to make disciples. Newsflash. And so, God, uh, let, let me... Let me follow through today with the opportunity you give me. Because you will give me many. Mark Dever puts it this way. If you have ever seen pigs come through a trough, um, come to a trough for mealtime, you can probably imagine it. Pushing, shoving, snorting, swallowing as much as they can um, with no thought for others. It almost is like when we feed our teenagers on Sunday nights. Uh, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> There's a funny question worth thinking about this for a moment. Is that how you attended church? I'm not calling you a pig, but stop and consider where did you park? What time did you get to church? Where did you sit? Who did you speak to? Each one of these decisions provided you with an opportunity to look out for yourself and to do what was best for you. So which was it? Did you consciously strategize on how to bless others with each one of those decisions? Now, we can roll that from church and make it more convicting. How are you doing it in your job? How are you doing it in your school? How are you doing it at Walmart? How are you doing it when you shop? Being a disciple of Jesus means orienting our lives towards others just as he did. Disciples, disciple. True Christianity is personal, never private. Please get this. It hit me. True Christianity is personal, but it's not private. Now, let me explain. If you do not know who Jesus is and you are going to hell, that's private. But if you know Jesus, he saved you from your sinful life. You were unrighteous and now you're righteous. And you're going to heaven? That's not private. That's public. We get excited about that. 
We share that. We don't go to, oh man, Jesus saved my life. I'm so happy. Are you okay? Come on, you don't know the same Jesus I know. He is full surrender to him. Here's a picture of this, how Christianity is not private. You can look into China where there's a billion Chinese people. And the church there doesn't even recognize a pastor unless he has been in prison for two years. That's a seminary. They don't think he's worthy to pastor a church unless he's been persecuted. Um, You don't get that way unless you're public. And then you're not considered a church member in China unless you have led somebody to the Lord. And you're having a house church. Wow. That's hardcore. Uh, The faith is booming there, by the way. 100 million Chinese Christians. Come on. How can, we, how can we get some of this? How, how, how do we do? Okay. Um, several years ago at a, at a disaster relief training, I was haunted by this quote. I pray that it is way off, but I um, really think it's really true. Um, it said that 97% of those who profess Christ never share their faith. What? I'm Southern Baptist, man, to the core. I was sitting there going, we need to talk about, this This needs to be the conference. I mean, I don't want to learn how to just put food into a, you know, clamshell and put it into a cooler. I want to learn why we aren't doing what we're supposed to be doing. And that's the problem, I think, because then we spent 45 minutes on talking about how to put food together. We had to spend no more time on going, wait a minute, why are people in here who profess Jesus Christ as Lord Why do we never have a conversation about Jesus? 97%. And so I start going, God, forgive us. Forgive us that we as evangelicals, evangelistic by our heart and nature, do not want to talk about you. And I think we're a little above average because if that hit our church, it'd be like nine people in here are the only ones that share the gospel. But also, intentionally, I think that's because we send people to uh, Brazil and to in Atlanta and to other areas to where they have to share their faith. And we are going, hey guys, have these conversations. And so that's a good thing. But I still think... If we start taking that number away, how close are we to the 97%? Um, 